Що знизу буйний вітер повіває, Противна хвилешення я, хвиля уставає. Суд на козацький, молодецький, на три часті розбив. My name is Viliana Tkach, and I direct Yara Arts Group from La Mama Experimental Theater in New York. We continue our series, a virtual one it is, for the Ukrainian Museum on Zinovi Stokoko, a virtuoso bandura player in New York in the 1960s. Today we look at what he's best known for, his Ukrainian epic songs or dumas. You'll hear actually three different ones tonight. At the top of the show, you heard uh, Shalkoko perform the beginning of the Duma uh, for Alexei Popovich. I'll talk about how Ukrainian epics came down to us. Then Master Bandura player Julian Katasti will give us some insight into Shalkoko, the Dumas and the Bandura. We have special guests, Andriy Honyakevich from Edmonton and Yuri Fedinsky from Ukraine on tape and also Dmitro Hubiak live with us from Ukraine. Dobry den, ja Virlana Tkač, hudožni kirivnik Jare Mestečko i Grupe v Njorku v Ukrajinski dilnici. Sjohodnji počujem zapis, zapis je dume z Novije Štokoka z Njorku. Tudi pohovorim z Barndurestom Julijan Kitastem pro Štokoka, ta jeho zapisi i dume. Takož počujemo vid Andrija Hornjatkeveča z Motonu i Kanade i Jurija Fedinsko z Ukrajine i prelučit se do nas Dmetro Hubiak. If you'd like a program with the list of music in everyone's bios, you can download it from Yara's homepage, www.yaraartsgroup.net. And our event is sort of bilingual. Everyone speaks in their own language and sometimes we summarize in translation. Naš večer domovni, majem proberamku, ali tiki po en lihki, ko možno nadrukovati z naši web storinke. V nas balenki ritual, počnajem kožno pod i vinkom. 
we have a little ritual. We start each um, event with a bell and uh, welcome to our arts group and all the poetry and music and images that inspire it. To today, Yara's not at La Mama, but virtually in space with you. Here is Shtokoka performing the beginning of the Duma for Kozak Hulopo. Like all the great epics of the world, each performance is really an original. And it's created by the performer as it is sung. How oral literature is performed really depends not only on the singer, but also the audience and how the singer perceives the audience's interest in a particular part. Ukrainian epic songs, or dume, were sung for centuries by bards who accompanied themselves on kobzas, banduras also, and liras. Uh, the kobzari sang in marketplaces, in homes, wherever crowds passed or gathered. And today we know approximately 38 dumas with hundreds of variants how these ephemeral works of performance art came down to us is a big question. How was this ancient oral tradition preserved? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. As we discussed in previous segments, at the beginning of the 19th century, romanticism created this great interest in Europe for folk tales, folk songs, and epics. People from the cities, amateurs and scholars, set out into the countryside and started collecting folk culture, well, from the folk. This is also what happened in Ukraine. The texts of the Dumas were first collected in the beginning of the 19th century. By um, mid-century, the words to Ukrainian epics had appeared sort of as poetry, really in collections by Kostomarov, the man in the center here, Chubinsky on the left, and Rohomanyu, as well as many others. But little information was then collected by the actual oral performance, uh, or about the music, or the performance, or who their audiences were. We know the singers were organized into guilds, who limited information available to outsiders. One of the few people who had information on the guilds was Porfi Martinovich, the man on the right here, who had apprenticed as a kubzar. Martinovich is actually a fascinating character. He is the artist who started doing drawings to folk songs on a new visual effect, which was called the Drummond Light, a kind of prototype of early cinematography or maybe the first slide projector. Uh, and he was doing this at Lysenko's 1875 concert in St. Petersburg. So you can really call him an early multimedia artist. But later in Ukraine, Martinovich would have his life threatened by the Kobzar guilds because they thought he knew too much about its inner workings and they were afraid he would share it. 
Um, by the beginning of the 20th century, the interest in traditional culture really grew exponentially in Ukraine, as well as its awareness that it was disappearing before our eyes. In 1902, there was a conference that brought, brought all these issues to the fore. The urban audience discovered the Kobzari. Uh, scholars and artists and amateurs started not only publishing texts, but also drawings and of the performers. And as the technology in photography advanced and allowing for easier picture taking, we start having visual records of the performance captured on film. Uh, soon technology allowed us to hear the performances. Edison uh, created the first phonograph with wax cylinders. The, the machine had a wind up motor, so you didn't have to plug it into anything that allowed for home recording and for more importantly, recording in the field. And it was really used a lot by ethnographers. Uh, this is the machine that recorded the last of the speakers of many languages. Uh, the device was beautifully simple. The power of the voice pushed a tiny little diaphragm at the end of the horn. And that diaphragm was attached, uh, to that diaphragm was attached a little knife that cut the grooves in the wax cylinder and voila, a recording. Um, just as, uh, just such a phonograph was brought to Ukraine. Um, first, Kotkevich and Stasyon uh, try, uh, set out to record the Kobzeri, but somehow the project fell apart. Then Lesha Ukrainka and her husband, Clement Kvika, became the sponsors of the project to record the Kobzars. Here we have the two of them in Hadjach with a Kobzar. Uh, and here is um, a fake photo. It's actually one we made based on the first one. And you can see in the second here, we have Lesha Ukrinka recording in Yalta. Well, she actually did some of the recordings there herself and there, there are no pictures, however, but there is a wax cylinder with her voice saying one, two, three. And we use this scene in one of our shows. Now let's listen to an actual wax recording. Here is Marusha Boslauka from 1909 as sung by Stepan Pashuha, recorded by Opanas Stasyon. Well, as you can tell, the wax cylinders are hard to hear, plus um, they would not last long under extensive use. So to preserve these songs and music, um, the music had to be transcribed into notes. Unfortunately, the kobzars did not sing in standard Western in minor keys. And there was only one man who could actually do this transcription. He was Filaret Colasa, who had studied at the University of Vienna under Bruchner. And Lesha Ukrinka realized this is the man who could get the job done. She had the cylinders delivered to his home in Lviv, which was in another empire at that point. It was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And I was lucky to actually see these wax cylinders a hundred years later because there's they were still at that point in his home. Kolesa did the impossible. He actually transcribed almost 70 cylinders. And in the middle, you can see a, a zoom of a slide view of a cylinder. And they're large, they're about the size of a beer can, these cylinders. Below is the cylinder top with the ID, Marusha Boslauka, sung by Pashuha. This is the very cylinder that you just heard. And um, this is on, on the two sides are the front and the frontest page of the book Kolesa would publish. 
Here is um, a Colossus transcription of the beginning of Marusha Bohuslauka. Uh, and after transcribing all the melodies of the Dume, Colessa returned to the University of Vienna in 1918, and he defended his dissertation on this topic and received his PhD and published his book. The Duma became the talk of intellectual Europe that year. There are several theories as to where Duma come from. Colesa, for one, believe that the folk Duma are somehow related to folk funeral laments, the Plachi. The other great figure in Duma publications and preservations in the 20th century was Katerina Hrushevska, the daughter of Mikhailov. She set out to publish a scholarly edition of all the Duma texts in all their variants. Her book, The Ukrainian Folk Dumas, The Corpus, was planned as a set, six volume set. Two volumes came out, one in 1927, the other one in 31. Volume three was ready for publication, but was confiscated when she was arrested and it was destroyed by the authorities, as were all of Hrushevska's manuscripts. Katerina herself died in a Soviet labor camp in 39, and many of the Kubzars perished in 33 during the famine, including Martinovich. Others like Khotkevich were actually executed. But despite all this, the Dumas of fragile performance art managed to survive. And um, they survived in, in New York of all places with Zinovi Stokoko, who came here in 1952. Now, please help me welcome Julian Kitasi, the Bandurist in New York these days, who is one of the reasons the Dumas are thriving in our fair city. Um, Julian, the historical setting of the tales, the Stokoko sang, the Berlin, was all in Kiev and Rush. But are there any Kiev and Dumas? I mean, what's the historical setting here? You got to turn on your sound. Uh, no, uh, the epics. Uh, that we listened to in a previous segment, the Belene, are the ones that came down from the period of Kevskarus. But um, uh, the Dume uh, are from a later time, uh, still a long time ago, uh, the 1500s, 1600s. Uh, it was a time of um, a constant warfare along the coasts of the Black Sea and in the southern steppe. Uh, the rising Turkish Empire had just uh, knocked off Byzantium, capturing Constantinople in 1453. And uh, that led to this round of uh, constant warfare. Uh, also, um, the empire had an appetite for, uh, for slave labor. So constant slave raids went up into the territory of Ukraine and brought back slaves, uh, laborers for the fields, and uh, also, uh, also uh, slaves for the harems of the, uh, of the nobility. Uh, and uh, the oldest cycle of the Dume deals specifically, very specifically with these events. Uh, they're songs uh, about captivity, about escape from captivity. Uh, their songs about the heroes of the fight uh, in the steppe against uh, the Turks and their allies. Um, one of the, uh, and today, today we're going to hear one of these Dume uh, from, this, uh, from this cycle, uh, the Duma about Marusa Bohuslavka. Uh, we'll hear the, the whole story of uh, Marusa Bohoslavka, as she's called in the Duma, uh, uh, as she's called in the Duma, uh, the slave girl Marusa 
priest's daughter from Bohuslav. Uh, Zinovi Stokoko recorded it several times. In an earlier episode, we heard his uh, first 1952 recording that he did for Myron So Much. Uh, and today we will listen to a somewhat different version uh, from the basement tapes, uh, recorded uh, January 27th, 1956. Uh, Stokolkos Bandura uh, sets the tone, uh, and the story begins like this. On the Black Sea, on a white rock, there stood a dungeon dug into the stone. And in it, there were 700 captives who had not seen the light of day for 30 years and three. At the top of the tape, you can hear Stokolko give the date of the recording and the technical data. Electro voice. Marusia Buslauka. This first section of the Duma ends uh, with the appearance, the first appearance of the heroine, Marusia Bohuslavka. The slave girl Marusia, priest's daughter from Bohuslav. Every time she comes up in the Duma, she's referred to exactly that way, with that complete uh, block of, uh, with, with that complete formula. Uh, the slave girl Marusia, priest's daughter from Bohuslav. Divka Branka, Marusia Popivna Bohuslavka. Uh, the poetics of the Dume, uh, and indeed of all oral poetry, are built upon this kind of repetition of poetic formulas, uh, whole blocks of text. Uh, they're very apparent in, um, in Marusia Bohuslavka, uh, 
when the uh, the characters are being identified. The captives uh, are always kozake bidni nebojnike every time that they're mentioned. It's exactly like that. Uh, Marusia is, is always with her full thing. Uh, other other phrases, uh, stock phrases also turn up. Uh, the the cliff over the Black Sea is always a white rock. Uh, the falcon in Dume is always a bright falcon. Um, uh, these um, uh, and these kind of uh, uh, these kind of formulas migrate uh, and recur not only within a Duma but from. Uh, song to song uh, with the same singer from between Dume performed by different singers. Uh, and um, it's, um, uh, you know, it's really an essential mark of this uh, style. It's something which, uh, uh, and of oral, all oral epic poetry, this is something Albert Lord wrote about famously in uh, his book in the 1930s based on research with oral epic poetry in what was then Yugoslavia. Uh, but uh, looking at Dume from that perspective, uh, they really start to make sense. The, their poetry starts to make sense. Well, the repetition actually helps the singers remember the story and sort of feel out their, it gives them time to feel out their audience, really. It's sort of like a vamping device. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once uh, once a singer has started one of these blocks of text, they have a little, a little bit of time to uh, remember what comes next. Uh, and yeah, they can sense what uh, the response from the audience. And that's why, uh, the same Duma recorded from the same singer, uh, sometimes uh, very close together in time, uh, will be of you know wildly different length. Uh, you know, in one performance, uh, he'll feel uh, inspired by the audience to elaborate a lot and go on about all the details about, um, and uh, you know, the captives in the dungeon will rattle their chains and raise up their arms and. Uh, and uh, weep bitterly, and in others, uh, uh, just matter of factly, there's 700 captives there. <laughs> so, and how does the bandura work in this complex? Well, the the bandura uh, that the Kobziri played. Uh, this is a reproduction, uh, which was uh, um, made for me in Canada by Vasil Vetzel. Uh, but uh, the bandura that the Kobzeri played uh, was, um, it, you know, it's really one of these uh, plucked stringed instruments that you find, uh, uh, which is what you find all over the world accompanying epic song. And uh, I think there's, uh, there's a reason for why plucked stringed instruments are so uh, common in this world. Um, there's something about the nature of the sound, uh, about the sound envelope the way it starts, lasts, falls off, that captures and holds the attention. And at the same time, it doesn't overpower the voice. It's, uh, uh, it's an ideal accompanying instrument. Uh, and uh, we've found that in our theater productions, that it's an ideal accompanying instrument for spoken word. Um, but, um, and the Kobzeri were very close sometimes to spoken word in their performance of the Dume. Uh, not all of them had voices uh, that would fill an opera stage. They, uh, uh, sometimes they would simply uh, hit, a, hit a chord and hit a chord and then recite for a while very softly. And then change the note and recite a little bit longer. And uh, the way this instrument is set up, It's a little bit different than the modern banduras. It really is uh, set up for a modal uh, idea of music. Uh, we talked about modes in one of our earlier episodes. Um, and, um, uh, but uh, uh, crucially, it's, uh, uh, they're tuned so that there's several, uh, 
several uh, centers of uh, rest. Uh, uh, three, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Each of these three notes can be the center for uh, a bit of melody. So if the composer wanted to get your attention, or if the, the song got very emotional, that were dwell on this upper part of the melody. And then you could descend with a flourish. And on this lower note, you could just recite for a while and get on with the story before coming to a cadence and maybe ornamenting it like that or like that. And um, uh, this, uh, this sets up this constant movement through, uh, between these tonal centers and through the text, uh, which is very important with the Duma because uh, uh, unlike some other uh, styles of poetry, they have an irregular line length. Uh, and um, and so, uh, so th these different phrases of music have to adjust in performance uh, along with the text that the singer is also partially improvising. Uh, so this is how this could work in, um, uh, in Marusa Bohuslavka picking up from where Stokoka left it off. So we've just seen mm, and this begins uh, the dialogue of Marusia and the captives. Um, again, the dialogue uh, structure is a formula. Uh, Marusia uh, uh, comes up to the, to the dungeon. Um, and speaks with words. She never just speaks, she speaks with words. Slava me promovlyaya. And then uh, the captives listen and they hear her and they speak with words. Um, so what does she say? She comes up and says, uh, oh captives, uh, do you know what day it is back in our Christian land? And they answer, well, they recognize her by her voice and they answer, well, how are we supposed to know? We've been in this dungeon for 30 years. Uh, are you making fun of us? And the slave girl Marusa, priest's daughter from Bohuslav, uh, hears this and speaks with words. 
and she tells them that today in our Christian land, it's a Holy Saturday and tomorrow is Easter Sunday. The captives hear this and speak and they're very upset by this because she's reminded them in their captivity of, of the holy day of Easter. And they curse Marusa. May she never have good fortune in her life again, that she's reminded us in our bitter captivity of Holy Easter. A divka branka Marusa popivna bohuslav, kata te je začuval. До козаків бідних невольників словами промовляє. Ой, козаки, ви козаки бідні і невольники. Ой, то ж знайте ви, да ви дайте, що сьогодні в нашій землі християнській великодня субота, а завтра праздник, святий день, роковий день, великдень. Бідні невольники ти зачували, ой, ще гірше плакали, ридали. Дівку Бранку Маруся попів на Богуславку, кляли, проклинали. Ой, бодай же ти, дівка Бранка Маруся попів на Богуславку. Та вже ніколи собі щастя й доленьки не мала. А що нам, бідним невольникам, Та в темниці бісурменській Святий Великдень нагадала. Thank you, Julian. Now, I understand you've been talking to Andriy Hurnyatkevich, who actually studied with Zinovi Stokoko in 57. There was this group of four students that Stokoko had, actually it would be the only formal teaching he ever did. Uh, Dr. Hurnyatkevich went on to a distinguished academic career. He received his PhD from Berkeley and for many years was at the University of, of Alberta and um, very involved with the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. He actually edited and published Stokolko's Kobzad Handbook and Repertoire Collection, which is called uh, Kobza in Canada. So what did you all talk about? Well, first of all, I asked Andriy Hornetkevich what he remembers of Stokolko as a person and teacher. I mean, we've only known him from these black and white photographs. This is somebody who is in the room learning to play from Stokoko himself. I would say he was, I wouldn't say he was the restraint, but on the other hand, he was not uh, exactly gregarious, uh, you know, a happy backslapping type of person, no. Because this was, of course, serious business. We were students, and he was the teacher. And I never got to know Stokolko outside of lessons. Uh, our late friend Miroslav Djakowski did, I think, much more. Uh, but uh, what also was the fact that at that time I was either a sophomore or junior in university. and. Uh, still very much raw, very much uh, uh, waiting to ripen, uh, to develop. So I did not pay attention to this other personal uh, aspect. Uh, for me, it was, of course, learn as much as I can from this man, uh, this master, 
and hope that uh, I can continue on my own. Uh, even um, even then, uh, when he was uh, just starting university, Andriy Hornetkevich was very interested in Dume, and he shared his teacher Stokolka's advice for how to approach this musical genre. He suggested you simply learn the text and a melody one of one Duma, master that, and then take off on your own. And uh, this, uh, although again, we did not get very far in a practical sense in those uh, in that particular area, but the most important thing is that he set us out on a path and he showed us how to go on that path. And then of course it becomes your own creation, your own composition. So armed with that advice, and a copy of Stokelko's 1952 Surma recording, um, Andriy eventually learned all of Marusa Bohuslavka. Uh, he was filmed in performance on a trip to Ukraine in 1992. So he will pick up the story. Uh, we've heard it to the point where the captives curse Marusa and she hears them out and again speaks with words saying, uh, I have a plan. Kamarusia po tim do Bogoslavka začuvaje, do kozakim slovami promovljaje. Hej, kozaki, panove mlodci, ne lajte mene, ne proklinajte. Bude zavtra paša turecki do večeti vidježdžati, Bude meni, divci, branci, marusi, popivni, bohuslavci, na ruke ključi izdavati. Oj, tadi što ja budu dobre dvati, do vas zahođati, na ristu bramu vidmekati. Ka vsih vas, kozaki, vidnih nevoljnih i vz nevolji vepuskati. Praznik na Velikdin, stav paša turecki do mečeti vidježdžati, stav divci, branci, marusi, popivni, bohuslavci, na ruke ključi izdavati. Oj, tudi što divka branka dobre dvaje, do kozakim zahođaje, za riznu bramu vidmekaje, ta vsih kozakim nevoljnikim z nevolji vepuskaje. So, Marusia knows that that the next morning their Turkish lord will be going to the mosque and she will be able to get a hold of the keys. So she promises the captives that she will come and release them. And then lo and behold, the next day, uh, she does in fact come in much the same words and release, uh, open the doors and release the captives from the prison. But what happens next? <laughs> well, this uh, this is not the end of the story. Uh, the, she speaks again, uh, telling the freed captives to hurry and get on their way, uh, start the long, dangerous journey back to their homes. Uh, the Turks will be after you. So avoid, she says, the beaten path across the steppe bypass the first towns, but don't, pipe, don't bypass the town of Bohuslav. Carry my message to my father and mother. Uh, this next part of the Duma will be performed uh, by another uh, American-born Bandurist, Yuri Fedinsky. Uh, Yuri uh, came uh, as a student to a Bandura camp in the early 90s, uh, became very interested in the instrument, at, at first uh, knew no Ukrainian, but got more and more interested in this material. Uh, he was later a member with myself and Mike Andretz of the experimental Bandura trio in New York, 
uh, and we listened to a lot of Stokelko with the experimental, or experimental Bandura trio. And eventually, uh, Yuri got so interested in this, he started going to Ukraine and eventually never came back. He lives there now in a village near Poltava, uh, bringing up four kids uh, with his wife and um, uh, building instruments, building uh, uh, bandure, uh, kobzar style bandure, building other traditional instruments, uh, uh, performing. He's on a little tour right now, uh, since why he can't be here with us. Uh, and um, um, and he's uh, learned the language enough that he can perform some of those things that we listened to a long time ago on the Shlokoka tapes. <laughs> So Marusa tells the captives to get going, uh, but she isn't going with them. She tells them to give her parents this message in Bohuslav. Tell my parents not to sell off their lands, not to raise money, not to ransom me. Because I have become as a Turk, I have adopted their faith. I can never go back. And that is the end of the story of Marusa, the slave girl, priest's daughter of Bohuslav. Uh, but it isn't the end of the Duma. Uh, like many of the Duma about captivity and escapes, uh, this one ends with a prayer. Uh, we will hear Stokolko sing it. O oh Lord, deliver all poor captives to freedom, to where the stars shine bright and the waters are calm, to their own towns, to their own land amongst, amongst their people. And to all listening uh, here today, Manoha Yalita, many years. That was Zinovi Stokolko from his basement tapes recorded uh, January 27th, 1956. I asked uh, Stokolko's student, Professor Hrnetkevich, where he sees Stokolko in the context of the development and history of the Bandura and especially of Duma performance 
in the 20th century. He said Stokelka was unique and explained why. He could, in theory, have had access to the wax cylinders that uh, Lesio Ukrainka, Slastion, and others had recorded from the old style Kobzari. But he certainly had access to uh, Filaret Colas's public publishing of the scores. Mm -hmm. And he could easily have learned from that. However, he did not stick to the scores at all, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, in many respects. All right, with Marusia Bohuslavka, I would say yes. But with Oleksiy Popovich, Utacha uh, Turkbratius Azova, he goes off in a totally different direction, absolutely unique. And uh, I would argue non traditional. All right, traditional in this sense that the text is traditional, yes. Uh, the, the mode in which it is performed is also traditional. However, his instrumental interludes, his vocal performance is way beyond what was practiced at the turn of the 20th century. Mm. It's totally different. We wanted to pose uh, the same question to our friend from Ukraine, Bandurist Dmitro Hubiak. Uh, who's also performed Stokoko's Dume and other, uh, other compositions. So Dmitro joins us now live from Ternopil. Dobro večera. Dobro večera. So Dmitro, for you, for your students, with whom you are now working, what is your vision of Stokoko as a bandurist? Зокрема, як виконавця Doom у цьому загальному контексті бандури в 20 столітті. Ну, для мене найважливіше і найбільш цінне є те, що завдяки творчості Штокалка сьогодні в Україні відроджується, відроджується е, традиція гри харківським способом і харківська бандура. Його творчість стала таким поштовхом і фундаментом, на якому ми сьогодні реставровуємо, відновлюємо оцю перервану традицію. Штокалко's uh, work, uh, his recordings have become the foundation for the work that we are doing now, trying to uh, trying to revive, reconstruct, and renew uh, the, uh, the Bandura tradition. Especially important in this, of course, is uh, 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 the renewal of the Kharkiv style of playing the instrument, which is something that uh, we talked with Metro at length about uh, in the first episode in this series, and I strongly recommend people interested in his work and what's going on in Ukraine right now uh, to have a look at that episode if they haven't already. Ну, справа в тому, що історично склалося так, що в 30-х роках 20-го століття сталися дві, скажімо, трагічні події в українській культурі і, зокрема, в кобзарському мистецтві. Одна з них – це якраз припинення кобзарської традиції, такої автентичної кобзарської традиції, яка існувала століття, століттями до того. А друге – це також припинення побутування харківського способу гри на бандурі, який був на той час визнаний як найбільш перспективний. Цей харківський спосіб, він е, надалі, після трагічної загибелі Хоткевича, зберігався і е, розвивався лише в діаспорі. The, uh, the historical circumstances were such, uh, Dmitro says, that um, there were 
two horrible things that happened to Bandura in Ukraine in the 1930s. Uh, one was the complete destruction of the Kabzar tradition, as we heard Vilana mention earlier. Uh, the second, um, and the breaking of this tradition, the second was the breaking of the development of the Kharkiv style of play, which uh, <clears throat> was showing itself to be the, have uh, tremendous perspectives for the future. Попри те, що в 20 столітті були спроби відновити харківський спосіб гри в Україні, але ці спроби не мали успіху. І лише завдяки, завдяки аудіозаписам виконання Зіновія Штокалка, які повернулись в Україну, цей спосіб гри сьогодні відроджується. І я думаю, що це... Це відродження Харківської бандури в Україні стало можливим і стало успішним якраз завдяки тому, що, е, що у записах Штокалка повертається до нас якраз не тільки Харківська бандура, але й та кобзарська традиція, її суть, е, яка якраз виражається і в імпровізаційності е, виконання, і в тих жанрах, які представлені у його аудіозаписах. So the uh, uh, so this tradition was broken in Ukraine and uh, survived, uh, especially in the work of Stokolko in the diaspora. And it's uh, so tremendously important now uh, to have uh, to have these recordings, have as examples of uh, uh, and uh, the ideas that come from them for how the instrument can develop in the future. В першу чергу, найважливішим для нас є якраз жанр думи, як найвагоміший і в якому най, найкраще ілюструється оця кобзарська традиція і імпровізаційність, і е, віртуозність акомпанементу, і особливості е, кобзарської речитації, е, співомови. Е, але... Але не тільки, не тільки це важливо, важливо те, що Штоколко показав, що ця традиція кобзарська, вона може бути живою і сучасною, зберігаючи свою суть за духом. Штоколко showed us, um, especially in the Думи, uh, with his performances uh, full of uh, improvisation, uh, uh, that showed his virtuosity, uh, he showed us uh, how this could be a vital genre today. І також дуже важливо, на мою думку, те, що в записах у спадщині Зіновія Штокалка ми знаходимо також інші жанри, які були недооцінені в 20 столітті тут в нас в Україні. Це і псальми, канти, і особливо цінним, я думаю, є такий жанр, як танки, музика, танцювальна музика кобзарська. Також мені, для мене особисто важливо те, як Штоколко розуміє діатоніку, цей звукоряд, особливий звукоряд бандури. З його записів, а також із, з творчості Юліана Китастого, я зрозумів, що діатоніка далеко не вичерпала свої можливості у порівнянні з хроматичним звукорядом. І вона може бути також надзвичайно сучасною і має також перспективи такі глибоко музичні. Uh, Stokelko in his recordings also shows us other genres uh, that uh, weren't, uh, that were kind of under, undervalued in Ukraine in the 20th century, uh, in his religious songs, but also in uh, the, especially in the dance tunes. Uh, uh, he shows us an ex examples of, of how, uh, of how this can be, uh, how these can be played. And 
also he shows uh, um, he show uh, in Stockholm's performances. Uh, uh, there's a particular approach to the bandura that's built around an understanding of the bandura as a modal diatonic instrument uh, that uh, actually can have a tremendously contemporary sound. Uh, and, um, and it's a very interesting uh, alternative new path of development for those who grew up with uh, the chromatic conservatory bandurās in Ukraine in the 20th century. І я думаю, що постать Штокалка і його творчість з кожним з кожним роком будуть набирати все більшої ваги і його роль в сучасному бандурному мистецтві буде лише зростати. Ми будемо все більше мати можливість оцінити, заглиблюючись у його творчість, зможемо оцінити всю глибину і кобзарського тих традицій, які несе Штокалко у своїй творчості. Тим більше, що ми маємо не тільки аудіозаписи, але також і кобзарський підручник, який також допоможе повернути специфічні прийоми гри і, і техніку виконавства харківським способом. And uh, Dmitro concludes by saying that uh, Stokolko's uh, figure in uh, Stokolko's importance in Bandura in Ukraine will only grow. Uh, we have uh, now not only his recordings, but we have the Kobzar handbook uh, that Professor Andriy Hornetkevich published, and uh, uh, we have uh, more and more material like this to work with, and this can become the foundation for very interesting future developments in Ukraine. Thank you very Dmitry. As always, it's wonderful to see you, even in Zoom. Uh, we wanted uh, we wanted to pose um, yeah we, we posed uh, in question to Professor Hernetkevich earlier, and I think as we conclude this series on Zinovi Stokolka and his music, we'll give the last word for now uh, to his student, Professor Andriy Hernetkevich. He was a voice in the wilderness. And to a certain degree, he still is, to a certain degree. But the fact that this new movement in Ukraine, movement, let's, let's be honest. But nevertheless, I think that there is this heritage of Stokolko that people now know about him and realize what a giant he was. Well, thank you all. That was fascinating. Now, um, what we have coming up, and actually it's much sooner than usual because it's gonna be next week, we have an, a Zoom uh, event with artists who took part in Yara's show based on poet Olaf Lishaha, so poem called Raven. And that Zoom event will premiere um, October 29th. Uh, that's a week from today. And after that, we're gonna have a world epic festival. And uh, this episode on Stokoko actually is just the beginning of that. And yes, our diaspora preserves and creates Ukrainian culture, but it also looks to the world. So let's hear it for Julian Kitasti and Andriy Hornetkevich and Yuri Fidzinski, who were on tape with us, and Metro Hubiak, who actually managed to connect. And our visual designer was Avalma Klushko. And thank you, Darian, for running our tech. Give us a wave there. And a big thank you to our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. And that's the New York State Council on the Arts, Bandura Downtown, and all the friends of Yara Arts Group. We rely on your support. So stay healthy and stay around and we'll see you live next year. 
uh, um, we have, as I mentioned, a theater program for the event. Download it from our website, and that's www.yaraartsgroup.net. And our exit music will be, of course, Stokoko, Duma Probratiu Azowski. Um, or Duma about the escape of three brothers from Azov. I'm Virlana Tkac. Thank you and good night. Третій піша пішеніця, як чужая чужениця, за конними біжить, підбігає. Чорний пожар під білі ноги підгортає. Словами промовляє. Брата пішов піхотинчика у Боже діте, хоч один ви милосердіє майте, о правні кульбаки добить з коней скидайте, мене брата піхотинця між дуконий беріте, хоч милю версту везіте, і дуриженьку кажіте, хай же ж я буду знати, як за вами вогору. Християнські з тяжкої неволі у гуті кого.